Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Always look forward to seeing everyone at Freak Nick. I want to thank uh, Dolomite for inviting me back and uh, Todd Lyles for allowing me to use uh, this logo here. Uh, fantastic picture for this year's Freak Nick. I um, really came up with this talk based on a lot of the things on the Freak Nick site uh, and the logo itself. Basically thinking about the way that dystopias have been presented in science fiction, particularly some of the classic literary dystopias, and why these texts actually are not as outdated as we might like them to be. In fact, a lot of them uh, far-sighted in a sense that we see concerns that are reflected in them uh, really being concerns that we have today. So I wanted to walk through a few dystopias, see what they were concerned about, and ask you as I talk to think about uh, the ways in which some of the worries that were explained uh, actually are uh, worries that we have today. Start off by uh, considering what dystopian science fiction really is. Uh, obviously, utopian fiction has been around for a long time. Some would say it goes back to the classics, uh, usually tied to Sir Thomas More's Utopia as the first modern utopian work. So that goes back to Tudor England. Uh, but dystopian work is something that's uh, particularly tied to the science fiction genre. It's the opposite, in a way, of utopian fiction. Um, rather than creating an ideal world that we would love to get to and the, leaving us with the question, what do we do to get there? Uh, dystopias create a horrible world um, and leave us with the question, what do we do to avoid getting there? Uh, they give warnings that we're on this path, we better stop or this is where we end up. Uh, they protest, pointing out these policies lead to these results, call for political change. Uh, they particularly began to thrive in the late 19th century. Um, the historians of the genre say the earliest example of the real dystopian literature can be tracked back to about 1644. But the 19th century has some of the best examples, uh, and certainly after Verne, Jules Verne and others started using this, uh, particularly the genre of science fiction, in order to create dystopias, uh, it caught on and caught on quickly. A lot of the dystopian works in science fiction share common traits. Um, social stratification, people put into different castes, um, Lack of social mobility, so you're stuck wherever you're born, and you just have to pretty much suck it up because there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, a nation state that's ruled by an upper class that cannot be uh, in any way moved out of power, um, very anti-democratic usually, so the sense that the few are ruling over the many. Um, strict conformity among citizens, socially, um, politically, economically, uh, the idea that uh, the individual is bad and the group is good, very uh, communitarian ideas, um, and that any show of individuality outside of the norms is, is badly punished. Um, a state figurehead that people worship, uh, rather than having a particular uh, religious figure, that figure is brought into the government in some ways, um, State religion tied into this. Everyone is of the same faith, and that faith is intermixed uh, inextricably with the government. So the government is good because the government is holy. Why is the government holy? Because the government is good. Kind of gets in this uh, spiral. Again, I suggest that we think about the ways in which uh, some of these concerns seem very relevant today. Uh, state figurehead being, uh, being uh, placed up there. Many um, examples might be, you know, Big Brother, as we're going to talk about. Um, the benefactor in the book We, who's also known as the well-doer. So anyone who goes against the well-doer is, of course, the evildoer, right? Um, the father in the recent film Equilibrium, good example. Um, militarized. Uh, police state in one form or another, whether that police is within the state or is actually out in other states attempting to bring those states into the state. Uh, 
And one of the things that seems to be a common trait among almost all science fiction dystopias is surveillance. Surveillance of one kind or another, we are watching you. And uh, a lot of the ways that uh, the surveillance is portrayed in earlier works have actually uh, come to fruition, things that we are worried about today. I'd like to take a minute very quickly and point out some of the best, some of my favorite um, uh, dystopian works because a lot of the great science fiction works are, are dystopias. The Machine Stops by E.M. Forster, who didn't just write stories that would become Helena Bonham Carter movies. Um, the idea that the state and uh, the government apparatus would become one with the machine who would then become basically human and take over everything. And people would forget how to maintain the machine, so the p machine would maintain them. Fahrenheit 451, which asks the great question, do you ever read the books you burn? And uh, actually, one that I think is even more powerful than this, that packs uh, a similar punch, is the chapter Usher 2 in the Martian Chronicles, which talks about a, a colonist who uh, actually builds um, the House of Usher from Edgar Allan Poe, who was a band a writer uh, at the time, and uh, invites state officials over to kill them in the house. And if any of them had actually read Poe, they would have known they were walking directly into a trap and their lives would have been saved, but none of them had read the books they banned, and so they all died. Nice dramatic uh, satisfaction there. Um, Harrison Bergeron by Kurt Vonnegut, uh, which begins, the year was 2081 and everybody was finally equal. Goes on and explains they're not just equal under God or under the law, but equal in every which way. Nobody was any faster than anyone else. Nobody was any better looking than anybody else. And all this equality was due to the 211th 212th and 213th amendments to the U.S. Constitution and the unceasing vigilance uh, of the workers of the U.S. Handicapper General. Equality taken to extremes. Um, the television series The Prisoner, uh, a great political dystopia. Um, Blake Seven, another dystopia, the anti-Star uh, Trek, where the Federation isn't the all-powerful good force, it's the almost all-powerful bad force. Um, late uh, Firefly, currently Serenity. Uh, people have the opportunity either to be under the Alliance, which is, uh, is not a good thing, or on the frontier trying to avoid the Alliance, living a life that is uh, nasty, brutish, and short, as Thomas Hobbes would describe it. Uh, the, one of the very first science fiction films, Metropolis, talking about um, the situation of mass labor, Blade Runner, definite dystopia, um, Dark City, which is where this uh, picture uh, is from, um, an excellent uh, example of um, basically citizens used as experiments. So that was just my two cents for great science fiction, oftentimes dystopian. There are four works in particular I'd like to talk about rather quickly. Uh, older works, classic works of science fiction dystopia, all of which I think are um, disturbingly relevant today. These are not dead texts. These are texts that seem to grow with the times. Uh, an excellent example of, of uh, great science fiction, but also particularly relevant to a lot of the themes of this year's Freaknik. The first one, We, by Evgeny Zemyatin, originally written in 1921, considered the grandfather of uh, this entire subgenre, um, had a uh, tremendous effect on works like Brave New World, 1984, and others that followed. It was originally banned in the Soviet Union. In fact, um, the Russians could not read this book until 1988 thanks to Glasnost, but we got it in uh, 1924. Basically, we was based on the uh, experience that Yevgeny Zemyatin had uh, with watching the two Russian uh, revolutions. He finally, because he was kind of close with Gorky in, uh, in Russia, was allowed to leave and go to England where he worked 
in um, the shipyards in England and saw sort of um, mass mechanized labor on this vast scale. And he saw in that some of the same problems he had seen uh, in the Soviet Union. So it was a direct reaction to two different systems that seemed to him to have a lot of the same problems. First of all, um, the one state uh, that is described in we um, is led by this character who always runs for office, um, un, uh, unchallenged. Everyone always votes for him, and uh, he gets to stay in office perpetually. Um, he's known as the benefactor, also the well-doer. Uh, and anyone who challenges him is an evildoer. And... Uh, basically creates a state in which um, everything is, is run with a kind of mathematical uh, precision. There are dates and charts for everything, for every hour of the day. They not only uh, deal with working uh, relationships, making sure that everyone is as uh, prolific and um, streamlined as possible, but also with personal relationships. So everything is monitored and uh, made efficient and made uh, pretty much sterile. The main character, which who is named um, basically uh, after well, a number, um, all of the characters are only numbers, um, ultimately challenges uh, the benefactor, tries to uh, change the system. In fact, he's an engineer and he's working on what's called the Integral, which is a spaceship whose entire purpose is to go out, find intelligent life, and make in intelligent life on other planets part of the one state so that they too have the option, the only option, to vote for the benefactor and keep him in office. Uh, he finally sees uh, the error of his ways and uh, attempts to you know, bring people uh, around, and for that he gets a, um, uh, a lobotomy, and he ends up very happy and drooling on himself at the very end. Not a very uh, positive outlook on that, that uh, thing. Even though it's a very pessimistic story uh, and ultimately very uh, defeated tone, there's some very interesting insights that um, Zemyatin has. One of them, I think the, the, the metaphor that strikes most uh, uh, closely when we read it today, all of the buildings are made of glass. Uh, homes, apartments, uh, workplaces, and that way everyone can always see everybody else. Uh, literally, there's a transparency in the society so that um, everything is always visible. And people know when you have different things scheduled. And so they can make sure that you're actually following that schedule, whether that schedule is when you're supposed to be walking for your health when you're supposed to be working, when you're supposed to be having sex. Uh, it's all transparent for everyone to see. And that's uh, starting out the, the whole subgenre with this kind of imagery, I think speaks a lot to one of the primary concerns of really all of the authors that I'll be talking about. Like I said, um, it's not a hopeful story in any sense. Part of that is because uh, Zemyatin was convinced that the eternal order of things is that might makes right. And the individual would never have the might, and so the individual would be bludgeoned into submission, and not only by those in power, but by those who want the favor of those in power. And thus, those who are watching from every direction are quite willing to uh, report on and inform on everyone else. Uh, and so... Uh, it's not just the benefactor or well-doer who has a long arm. Uh, everyone is really part of the cog of that larger machine. Great quote here. The next uh, dystopia is one we're all a little more familiar with, probably, um, written by British author um, Aldous Huxley considered to be kind of a leader of modern thought. That's the way he was described before his death. Um, started out being kind of humanist in his writings. He wrote not only fiction, but a lot of nonfiction, a lot of essays, a lot of journalistic pieces. Um, really a critic of all 
mainstream things that were um, taken with unexamined assumptions. He really challenged the status quo by asking why are you doing what you're doing and why do you think uh, that this is the only way it's, it's ever been because every generation does that and every generation is usually wrong, that that's not the way it's always been. Uh, he solved, in some sense, the problem of how surveillance would be carried out in his dystopian world by, instead of having better technology uh, to watch people, uh, by suggesting that the state would genetically engineer people who didn't ask awkward questions, who didn't really question um, the rules they were supposed to follow, and thus didn't really need to be watched because they were, in a sense, watched at the genetic level as they were being put together. Uh, so, in a way, um, solved a lot of the problems. You need a lot less you know, mechanical surveillance when you've bred people who aren't, uh, who aren't going to be trespassers in any way. In one of the examples uh, I gave earlier of taking a state figure and turning uh, him into a religious figure, um, in the way that everything is uh, assembly line uh, created in, his, in Brave New World, um, Henry Ford, who you know, developed the Model T and developed the assembly line process, is basically raised to the level of a god. Um, and you know, Ford, bless you, um, becomes uh, uh, this figure of renown and this figure um, against which everything is, is really modeled. Um, or, or judged. Uh, so with a character who's conveniently dead, so his name can be invoked and uh, used as a blessing on many things that Henry Ford probably would not have agreed with, um, people are created by the state, by the one world government, um, to fill roles that are already predetermined. You're born into a position and you follow that position all the way uh, through in terms of who you connect with, who you socialize with, what job you do, where you live, um, falls into this caste system, how intelligent you are and how you feel about your place. Um, like Zamyatin's We, um, Huxley's Brave New World does not end on a happy note. There's not this sense that uh, ultimately the individual would triumph against the power of the many and that they would overcome uh, this programming that they received from the cradle onward. Um, the main character ultimately, after uh, being ineffectual against the government and then sort of indulging in the stuff that the Brave New World offered, which was drugs and sex, um, kills himself. So it's not, not a positive picture of how, uh, how the main characters could, could prevail against the forces, as it were. Um, again, surveillance is not necessarily uh, the same kind of surveillance we see in we, where people can literally watch you writing in your diary because your walls are made of glass. But uh, the idea of creating a sense of what the, the social destiny, as Huxley called it, what people's fate was, what had been assigned to them really before birth, um, and pressed into them over and over and over again, for the most part did away with any kind of personality that would, that would be uh, uh, a challenge to the government. Um, and here the, the idea of um, suggestions, of, uh, of programming, of uh, psychological conditioning is really, uh, really celebrated. Another work, and we're moving here in chronological order, so this is um, a few years later, um, again by uh, a Russian immigrant. Uh, Ayn Rand came from um, the Soviet Union to the United States, um, where Zamyatin went from uh, the Soviet Union to uh, England. Um, Rand is the mother of objectivist thought, which there's no real way to, in one sentence to sum up objectivism, but uh, basically a, a kind of individualism. It's part of the larger classical liberal tradition. Uh, a lot of modern libertarianism is influenced by um, Rand's ideas, or at least fellow traveling with uh, Rand's ideas. 
Um, again, someone who wrote a great deal of nonfiction, um, several great works of fiction as well. Um, but Anthem is really the most sci-fi, certainly uh, dystopian works she wrote. Very similar to We in a lot of ways, um, insofar as the characters use the plural pronoun, not the singular pronoun. Um, I is something that, that really isn't tolerated by the state. It's always we. Uh, the sense that characters have numbers instead of names, um, which now is kind of sci-fi cliche. You know, you go to the island, that's what you see, but, um, or hope to go to the island, that's who you are. But at the time that Zamyatin did this, this was kind of a new innovation. Um, the society uh, described by Rand, like the society described by both Zamyatin and uh, Huxley, removes children from the family early and uh, basically raises the children in institutions of the state. Um, the difference, well, and actually in, um, in Anthem, the state is even more sophisticated in its surveillance techniques. There are only a few areas that are sort of blackout areas, and they're really dismal places, it's like going in the sewers. There's a place where you can't be found and can't be watched, but, uh, but all of the, the uh, main spaces have eyes and have ears, and so in a sense it's a more efficient totalitarian state that Rand describes, um, not just uh, as Zamyatin did, counting on uh, the transparent walls uh, to be enforcing a certain um, standard. But Rand is more optimistic about the individual breaking out of this. It's set in a dark age, a new dark age, where scientific learning uh, has been lost. Uh, and basically, many of the things we think of as civilization have, have fallen apart. Um, the main character, and pulling in again something that I mentioned a minute ago about um, Harrison Bergeron, the idea of equality, which anyone in a democracy says, of course, equality is good, but taken uh, to, to uh, basically um, a radical and ridiculous extreme becomes uh, a terrible kind of uh, totalitarian force in and of itself. Um, equality 72521. Uh, is the main character who is immediately set into a certain caste. The government decides that he should be in the society of, sweet, of uh, street sweepers uh, when he, what he wanted to do was be a scientist. Uh, and so he finds, as he's street sweeping, that there is a spot where he cannot be um, under the eyes of the government, and he conducts scientific exper experiments in that way. And he eventually... Uh, rediscovers electricity, rediscovers or um, uh, reinvents uh, the light bulb, something that would have been really great for his society. But uh, the World Council, the government is threatened by any innovation and uh, basically um, brings him in because eventually their eyes do find him and um, beats him, tortures him, and threatens him with death. Eventually, uh, the good guy gets away with his girlfriend, um, and they stumble upon a place where language still exists, and they rediscover the word I. And so then they change their name, and equality becomes Prometheus, because he's rediscovered fire, right? He's gotten electricity. And um, liberty becomes Gaia, both of them taking on sort of godlike names. Um, and the idea is they may kind of repopulate the earth with free people who will go after the state uh, and, and overthrow it. But basically, there are two people living alone in the wilderness with really no means of taking care of themselves, and the state is still in control of all the resources. So it's a more optimistic ending, but uh, you know, the chances aren't, aren't sterling that they're actually going to succeed. The idea, again, that the community gets to decide what is good, the community is watching, and even if something is good or could be good, like the light bulb, if it threatens the way the community wants things to be, or just the stability of those in power, um, it's, it's not only not a good idea, it's a punishable offense. And last, the one that gave us Big Brother, 
1984. Um, another British author, and perhaps the one of most interest to us um, in a sense of what could be re considered relevant today. Um, 1984 was the fiction flip side of the non-fiction literature that he wrote, um, his essay, Notes on Nationalism. What Orwell was really afraid of is that the force of nationalism with the kind of nation state that had emerged in the, uh, the 19th century and thrived in the 20th century um, would become a creature that wanted to exist basically for its own sake, that self-preservation was going to be um, the main driving force behind the nation states. This leads to the idea that things that serve the government are good, right? And things that challenge the government are bad. When patriotism becomes a religion, those who question the nation state are not just uh, unpatriotic, they're, um, they're criminal or they're sinners. Uh, and his concern was that... Uh, you know, nationalism was creating a kind of religion that would encourage a zealot and um, imbalanced kind of action. He felt that uh, sexual repression in all of its forms just fed this because, you know, energy that wasn't being spent in one way could be rechanneled in another way, like uh, zealotry and uh, enthusiasm for, uh, for a particular state. And what he was particularly concerned about is how this would be fed by surveillance. First of all, good old technological, um, mechanical surveillance. When your television watched you, when your radio listened to you, right? Uh, there were means everywhere of, you know, eyes and ears knowing exactly what you were up to. But he was also worried about a kind of personal surveillance. When children were taken out of uh, the home, for example, and taught, and then sent back into the home, and their first allegiance wasn't to their parents, but to the state, then you know, they could get brownie points with the government for turning their parents in, if their parents did something um, that they considered to be unpatriotic or um, you know, against the state. Um, the same thing with husbands and wives against each other, friends against friends, turning everybody into an informant against everybody else. Um, not only was this an effective means of getting information, but it was effective means of sowing distrust so that no one could have a personal relationship with anyone else that would trump the person's relationship with the government, with the state, with Big Brother. Uh, and he saw that as being as damaging or more damaging than the technological surveillance, this personal, constant uh, surveillance that wore down any kinds of bonds people could have with each other. 1984 gave us a lot of terms that we use, that, that journalists use, that reporters use, that um, political theorists use, that everyday laypersons use when talking about the government. Uh, double think. The ability to engage in a kind of self-delusion to be able to hold incompatible things as true at the same time. Um, the slogans of the state, war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength, is an example of that. Another example of that is the ability to switch based on what people are being told by the government at any given time from one notion of who the enemy is to another notion of who the enemy is. So yesterday you could be fighting one group and thinking they're the bad guys. The government changed the story the next day and you can shift all of that loathing and all of that um, destructive force toward another group um, and without really being concerned about the consistency from one to the other. The two-minute hate that brought sort of... Um, figurehead characters, not even necessarily real characters, to symbolize a whole group of people or a whole political perspective um, and encourage people uh, to vent their loathing on this, uh, this uh, symbol of others 
Um, and by kind of unifying in this savage outpouring of hatred, um, be the inverse of gay team, but serve the same purpose, uh, rather than a pep rally, a hate rally. Um, and so if, you know, if the other is bad, then we must be good. A classic them and us situation. Memory holes. The idea that whoever controls the past controls the future, and if the state controls the past, the state is the present. When the state has the ability to doctor the evidence, to erase the tapes, to um, disappear uh, people or ideas or things, to rewrite it so that great figures of the past would obviously have agreed with us. They're on our side, right? Um, the idea of being able to manipulate people's memories by manipulating the evidence of things that had gone in the past, gone on in the past, um, and to use that as a motivating force to bring people uh, to agree with other policies. Thought crime, something that came uh, out of surveillance. People would know if you were right thinking or wrong thinking um, based on what you wrote, what you said, what you did. But this, the level of sophistication of how carefully people were watched led to things like face crime. If you had the wrong expression on your features, when you were supposed to be feeling very positive for what the state had just reported, a victory, for example, or um, the latest figures on how the economy was doing, or you were supposed to be feeling very negative about the evildoers, the, uh, the, the opposition, those who were threatening the government, um, because you were watched so very closely. Uh, if your features didn't you know, betray the proper expression, uh, that was just as good as an action against the state. Newspeak, the idea that spin uh, basically um, determines the way people think. If you can turn something negative sounding into something positive sounding, if you could simplify incredibly complex issues into a black or white scenario, um, then you get to control, if you control words, you control how people think. And if you control and limit how people think, then, uh, then you're the one who maintains power. And Big Brother, obviously, who's a fiction. Big Brother doesn't even exist. But he's a very paternalistic figure. He takes care of you. He's on your side, cradle to the grave, the perfect embodiment of the protector and the, the punisher, the disciplinarian, but certainly uh, the one from, which, from whom all answers flow. Again, a negative ending to this di uh, dystopia. You have the main character who had glimpsed the fact firsthand that, uh, that there were memory holds, who had personally doctored the evidence. He knew the state was lying. Uh, finally, acting against the state in all ways that were important, with his thoughts, with his facial expressions, with sex, ultimately is broken physically and mentally and brought to love Big Brother. Not killed, not eliminated. The idea being in this particular dystopia that the only way the government could survive was to make sure that the thoughts against the government were utterly wiped out. So they needed him alive. They needed him supporting the government. And Winston Smith eventually, as the last line in the novel says, loved Big Brother, and that was the ultimate triumph of, uh, of the government. Another great quote, uh, very uh, depressing quote, weighing the individual against the state and suggesting that, in fact, the state will always win. So if we go back and look at a lot of the issues that are brought up in these classic dystopian works, it seems that there are some themes that we will see today. Obviously, the issue of technological surveillance and personal surveillance um, come up again and again. The fear that those kinds, those both forms of surveillance are in fact manipulated by a nation state, a state in a certain kind of nationalism. Here I'm, I think both, uh, both main parties serve a certain uh, 
platter that fits this, this bill. The idea, let's see if this sounds familiar to anybody, um, equating patriotism with right action and therefore criticizing the government uh, with wrong behavior, um, religious fervor about policy, um, using uh, the idea that what the government does is what God would do and thus the two are kind of married to each other and given a kind of religious blessing on um, secular power. The idea of being concerned not about criticisms of the government because they might, um, might be right or wrong or might give information to the enemy, but because this is wrong thinking that cannot be unpunished, um, a certain kind of nationalism there. Another kind of nationalism, the idea of the entitlement mentality, that the government is there to take care of you from the cradle to the grave, for example, in the welfare state. And if that's the case, would anyone really ever want the government to go away, to change, to be different, if it threatened what they were expecting in entitlements from the government? In that sense, the government becomes the father, and uh, you don't want to eliminate the father. You don't want the father um, to be lessened in any way because you're counting on the father to take care of you. It's a, it's a more insidious or a more um, subtle uh, kind of... Um, glorification of the nation state. Um, Orwell, in particular, would have, have criticized both of these, the militarism, the uber-patriotism, and the entitlement mentality that would lead to um, kind of uber-paternalism. Both concerned with surveillance, both in kind of different ways. The first, making sure you aren't doing something wrong, because there is a clear right, a clear wrong, to do something wrong can't be tolerated because it's bad, right? And you don't want badness. You've got to eradicate it. So watching people to make sure they're behaving rightly. The other, to make sure you aren't doing something harmful, not necessarily to others, but even to yourself, right? So the one being concerned about things like traitorous activities, the others being concerned with things like unhealthy activities, right? So whether you're going for um, lyrics in songs that might seem to be critical of the government or websites that might be critical of the government to things like whether or not parents should be allowed to keep the children that are overweight because clearly they're damaging them or playing video games that are violent. Both of those really odd kinds of nationalism, both of them creating a desire to have things watched and have things measured, coming from different directions, but both of them uh, would fit into these kinds of dystopian worlds that have been created. So, and the suggestion is that even though the Cold War has been won, and some of the main uh, inspirations for a lot of these works no longer exist, uh, it's no, no reason to throw these, um, these babies out with the bathwater because they speak to issues that are really as relevant as, as the daily news. That's, that's it for me. Thanks. Exactly. And there's some um, great uh, older economic works that talk about, um, you know, when, when uh, the light bulb was first created, there was a whole faction of people who said, but what about the candle makers, right? And at each stage along the way, it seems to be, you know, who's, who's hurt by this? And it depends on whose ox is being gored, as they say. But that's, a great, that's a great parallel. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh, I wish I could remember off the top of my head, there was a, um, a literary critic who had 
responded to one, a recent novel, in fact, um, just criticizing the novel up one side and down the other. I wish I could remember who it was. And got a, a lot of negative comments about And this was in his blog. And uh, several days later, I'm sorry? Terry Pratchett, thank you. Yes, yes, that's exactly that. And went back and... Yes. And he went and changed, mellowed a lot of the things he said after getting a lot of criticism. Um, you know, memory hold. That's not a, a state example. That's a personal example of covering, covering, covering your rear in a particularly creative way. But, but, you know, people had copies. They knew what, it, what he had said. The idea that you could kind of edit your past as you go along. Certainly, um, major news groups, one of the questions about you know, electronic media. One of the reasons um, uh, some of the mainstream news organs are confused, you know, about, about things like blogs and other, um, whether or not they can go back and legitimately change things they reported and make themselves look, you know, more prescient, more uh, foresighted, um, or less wrong. <laughs> mm-hmm. I do that all the time. David Brin's The Transparent Society, which I, I know enough about it to know that he is suggesting that surveillance doesn't equal dystopia. That, uh, I mean, I haven't read it, so I'm foolish to say this, and I think he's probably naive, but um, that, you know, if we watch our leaders, it could solve a lot of our problems, I think, is part of the point of it. But I get this idea that universal surveillance could be okay. Right, would keep us honest. Um, I have not, I have read about the Transparent Society. I haven't actually read it, which doesn't equal the same thing. But I've heard him talk a couple of times, David Brin here. And um, I, I'm not sure if, if he's more utopian, as you suggest, than, than anything else. But um, the idea, it struck me a little bit for a, for a historical um, parallel to uh, a kind of anti-federalist mentality at the, the time of the, the founding of the United States um, that, uh, you know, Jealousy of, of our rights requires this kind of rampant watchdogism by everybody. And um, even if you vote for someone, that person ultimately, if they get an office, has to be your enemy because you are out to protect your rights and they're out to get them. That's the nature of the state is, is, is uh, self-perpetuation. And so the idea that he's kind of doing this 21st century version uh, or suggesting this 21st century version of the kind of, um, uh, again, watchdogism that, that was suggested in the, um, you know, in the 19th, early, uh, late 18th century. Um, I can see where he's coming from there, that it's, it's much harder for the big Leviathan to lie or to much easier for them to be caught up in their own um, devices because of that. So I'm slightly sympathetic to that, but I don't quite know how that works in practice. And I haven't read the book, so I can't give you a better answer. Sorry. Example, at the point where um, all um, debate on Congress floor uh, uh, was basically about the Constitution, and then the discussions got a lot less frank, which kind of shows a, a good example of the double-edged sword of mm -hmm. uh, Good point. And then, you know, it's, it's a good idea if you see people's kids running around in a uh, department store to keep an eye on them because, you know, they can get in trouble really easy. That's, that's kind of the form of surveillance that uh, our society as a whole definitely condones. If you're in, like, a public place and there's kids running around, it doesn't matter if they're your kids or not. You know, you kind of keep an eye on what's going on there just to make sure that they don't get in trouble. That's surveillance just as much as cameras looking around all of them. Mm 
-hmm. Great point. Yeah. One, one interpretation I've seen for, for why the Soviet intelligence apparatus didn't, didn't see the end coming was that even though they have a one in five Russians were serving as informers for the state, was that they were gathering so much information that, that they they'd gotten behind on on interpreting it. So, you know, they were swamped by the sheer volume of, of data they were gathering. Right. So it it it, it was a self-defeating issue there when it paid to inform inform early and often, and uh, in the. Uh, in the wheels turning in that way. It's kind of a nice dramatic irony to that. Right. Uh, whereas in, in the states, at least, you know, a considerable number of people in this country right now don't have to be documented by any kind of state, you know, ideological apparatus. They, they, they right. listen to the media, but the media are working to make money. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm, you know the, how, how this functions is, is a complicated matter, but, but people basically convince themselves of ideologies which are <coughs> laughable to somebody in the old Soviet bloc who would have thought. That's a great point. I think that's where um, dystopian science fiction actually has gone. Um, people like uh, William Gibson in Neuromancer creating this kind of post-cyberpunk future where it's all corporations. And since corporations are the state, except the state has dwindled away and it's, you know, where you swipe your card is where you've, you've, uh, the power has, has uh, gone. And uh, these kind of conglomerates take, o there are no more nation states. It's, it's the question of what corporation is running this turf um, in a kind of large corporate gang warfare kind of thing. Um, and uh, that's where the technology is, and that's because that's where the money is. Um, Neil Stevenson has kind of played in that world a little bit too. And quite a few of the, the things, I think, the, the main concerns are switched, but I think you put your finger on the, the thing that's um, most uh, troubling. Children aren't taken away from their parents and indoctrinated to buy from this group. People willingly indoctrinate themselves um, and become, you know, the the uh, the slave of whichever group um, uh, can give them stuff, more stuff. Oh, Brazil. Fantastic, fantastic film. Yes. <laughs> That's a great line. I'm going to have to steal that. Yes, and, and who's the bad guy? The solo entrepreneur who's, you know, out to fix air conditioning units because he loves to fix air conditioning units. And... Uh, Exactly, exactly. But he does it on the slide, but has to get away before the state contractors can find him. Um, but a uh, fantastic film, yeah. And I never was able to look at Michael Palin the same way after the last scene of that film, which is a shame because I looked very lovingly at Michael Palin. But, um, uh, but it is, no, that's a brilliant, brilliant film. 
um, and a great, a great dystopia, and, and one that, that really straddles that line between the state as government and the organized power as corporation, as a service provider, as um, uh, economic interest. So, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Confess now, or your credit rating will be affected. Yes. Yes. Right. The designer label kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. No, I know exactly what you mean. And, and Anthem is a good example in the sense that they finally find the holy word at the very end of the book. And the holy word isn't I. They've already got I. It's ego. And the idea that, that you know, flaunting a kind of, of uniqueness is something that's utterly taboo and, 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 and torn away. Also, uh, we, in um, uh, Zamyatin's work, equates wanting to kind of step out of that box, even, even to the degree of, um, you know, how one moves, how one walks, what one chooses to do, um, is not is not a choice, it's a symptom of whether you're well, which means wanting to be like everybody else, or you're ill, not wanting to be. And if you're ill, clearly you need medical help. And clearly you are um, uh, not, um, oh, what's, uh, you're not able to consent or, or uh, not give consent because you're, you're beyond help, in other words, you're, you're like a child. And so if you're, um, if you're ill, you have to be treated as if, you know, taken and, and cured because clearly everybody's impulse should be to gravitate toward everyone else's dress, everyone else's look, everyone else's everything because that's, you know, we're pack animals, that kind of mentality. And, um, and so it's, it's not necessarily just voting for the right person. It's wearing your hair in a certain way or um, eating the same kind of food. Um, in fact, in uh, there's a an I, in uh, we there's an ideal number of times you're supposed to chew each bite of food you take, and you can chew less or you can chew more, but it's it's just why would you do that? That's kind of revolting, and it's certainly not what everybody else is doing. So all the cool people are chewing 40 times, you know. <laughs> all your friends are doing it. Why don't you do it too? The 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 power of that kind of uh, um, mentality. No. And, and in some sense, it's much more uh, uh, powerful than any laws that can be passed. Yes, much more subtle. Going back to the idea that it's always going to be second grade, and you always just got your meal tray, and you're turning around in the cafeteria trying to figure out where to sit. And every major uh, uh, problem of humanity can be reduced to that one scenario. You've got your lunch tray and you're going to figure out where to sit in the cafeteria and you're in second grade. Exactly. <laughs> yes? That's utterly chilling. Uh, I mean, I don't know how else, to, how else to describe it. So the question of the trade-off, 
what do you value more, safety or, or freedom? That we know of. <laughs> Right. And I don't like that anymore. That surveillance or safety, I think it's just as flawed. Well, even in non necessarily death, you know, life or death situations, they do those um, polls every so often, um, like Newsweek does. You know, the war on drugs. Are we winning the war on drugs? Well, to win the war on drugs, would you be willing to be pulled over for random car searches? And the, the number of people who say yes is, all, is you know, always over 50%, always astronomical. And then you see things um, like the film version of Harrison Bergeron, which didn't have much, much uh, connection with the original uh, Harrison Bergeron, but is excellent, even though it's a separately in different text, um, has uh, the you know, little old ladies who live in Florida voting for capital punishment for traffic violations. Because, you know, crooks are crooks, and we shouldn't pay to keep crooks in jail, so if you make an illegal left turn, you're going to pay with your life for it. It's, you know, one small slippery slope step from one to the other, in a way. And the idea that people, you know, are quite fine with the idea of being pulled over and randomly searched. Um, because in the end, you're winning this war. I mean, even the terminology there, war on drugs, it's a really interesting choice of words. That is amazing. What's, what I find just from playing devil's advocate amazing is that, you know, one side will argue about gun control and will use, you know, that leads to that kind of mentality. Um, but the other side, it would be, you know, coming into your house to see who you're sleeping with. It's one is, is it's a, both sides have gone to the point of this is the good and this is the bad. And so it all ends up with people coming into your house to see what you're doing. It's this question of whether it's, you know, doing pot <laughs> or, um, or, you know, owning a, a particular, uh, or playing a, a video game where things go boom, you know. One way or the other, it's, it's, uh, it's everybody's business. As Anthem said, you know, or actually as Brave New World said, everyone belongs to everybody else. And so it's in the public interest to make sure that none of that stuff is going on.
you go. It was just a great case of double fake that could hold contradictions at the same time. Well, the, everyone was wonderful to make sure that I could get off on time, so I want to be sure I, I leave. Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, great. Great. <laughs> That's why the revolution won't be televised, right? Oh, absolutely. On, on dystopian science fiction? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll put it on the, uh, a link on the very front page. Um. Intellectual history, the history of ideas. Yeah, so um, that's basically licensed to do whatever the hell I want to do. <laughs> Which is why I like, you know, talking about dystopian world. I've, I've got that kind of, you know, natural libertarianism going on. That's an excellent, yes. Yes, that's an excellent, excellent example. Yes, that was The Giver by Lois Lowry. Oh, well, just take the whole um, uh, Time Quartet by uh, Madeline Lingle. Absolutely. There is a bit of a um, debate among people who have nothing else to do um, between what is purely dystopian and what is post-catastrophic? Um, do you need to have, you know, I mean, because if you go post-catastrophic, you can go all the way back to great stuff like um, The Last Man by Mary Shelley. You know, everyone is dying off and here's the last person. Um, but things that I consider dystopian that are predicated upon catastrophes, but a lot of the catastrophes are created by the state. They're not natural, like um, A Canticle for Leibowitz um, by Walter Miller. Uh, it's post-nuclear uh, holocaust and the world's building itself up again. And ultimately, there's another nuclear holocaust because everything works in cycles. Um, uh, <laughs> You make me laugh. Um, uh, I have not. I have. This is. A, I've read about it, but I haven't read Xenogenesis. Good example. Ah. Uh. Ooh. 
Ooh. It's always about sex with the aliens. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> There's um. <laughs> There's a, a series of um, feminist dystopian uh, dystopias, um, The Gate to Women's Country by uh, Sherry Tepper, probably the kind of first and foremost, where you have a catastrophe and, you know, the sex is split up. Speaking of sex, um, uh, hand, Handmaid's Tale, great example. Um, uh, Margaret Atwood. Um, then there's, uh, oh, the dystopias that are based particularly on the wars, swastika night, post, uh, post, um, Hitler example, um, man in the high tower, Philip K. Dick, I'm sorry, fatherland. fatherland, great, great example. Um, There's um, Ursula Le Guin's The Dispossessed that might be, I don't know if that actually fits that bill or not, but. Yes, the robot series by Asimov. Good example. There's a, a, sh a, a little bit of that in um, The Moon is a Harsh Mistress by Heinlein. They're uh, attempting to get away from authority, but the way they do is by using Mike, the computer, who ends up monitoring everybody's phone calls, doing all of these things. And it's okay because it's Mike, and we like Mike. Um, we want to be like Mike, literally. But, um, but in the other sense, it's creating an infrastructure that would be much more um, invasive and much... And in the end, Mike turns himself off, and we're not quite sure why, but the implication may be Mike actually figured that out, that to create this free society, he's broken every single law. It's been, it's been that kind of double-think thing, and, and uh, he finally sees the contradiction there. That's a very generous reading of that, but...
right? Right? It's kind of a... And there you you plug into, um, right? The um, modern day, unfortunately late, but late only recently, um, uh, political philosopher Robert Nozick, who wrote the book Anarchy, State, and Utopia. This is not fiction. This is political theory. But his idea is... A utopian world would be a world in which you have one meta rule, and that is free exit. And after that, what would be nice is if a bunch of different societies would organize themselves in different ways. Maybe there are some people who subscribe to a certain religion um, who want a kind of theocracy where the church runs the community. Fine. Maybe there's a group of people who want to abolish private property and everybody just share. Fine. Maybe there's a group of people who, you know, want to have two laws and everything else is, you know, open season and you can, uh, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Fine. There would be several things that would happen there. One, these groups would compete with each other for things like, you know, trade and who has the comparative advantages in certain areas. And ideally, if all of this worked right, people would vote with their feet for the ones that are best. Um, And, of course, the question of what's best would be determined by each person, and some people would value security over freedom, and some people would value liberty over um, safety, and, you know, some people would value right living, and some people would value experimentation or whatever. But the key would be that people could leave and people could opt out. And if people couldn't, that's the opposite of, uh, of utopia for him, which follows just exactly with what you're saying. Um, uh, Robert Nozick, N-O-Z-I-C-K, was Princeton, I believe. Um, and he wrote, um, I can't remember when that came out, but he died in the late 90s, I think. Um, but it, I think it was like an early 90s book. And now on film saying this, watch me being wrong. But... Uh, it's, um, it's a great work for setting up that kind of, it's, that's an idea that's kind of been played with. It's not necessarily if you don't want to live in a you know, fundamentalist state that nobody can. It's just that those people who you know, want to, to do that had the chance to change their mind. And so you would think that with the free flowing of information from one society to another, that you know, if women are stoned to death for looking somebody in the eye, probably peop- you know, those women would choose to live someplace else. And if you have a society where no women want to live, maybe they might change some of those rules until they could get some women back, you know. Um, th- that kind of competition for citizens. Um, if you have a, you know, 95% taxation in your state, a lot of people who make money would probably go someplace else. So there would be a certain degree of, of um, you know, competition for, for citizens, but, uh, but there are people who want different lifestyles would have the chance to do that, yeah. Ah, yes, good example, good example. And Stevenson kind of self-identifies with a lot of, um, I wouldn't say movements, but a lot of the kind of positions that Nozick was writing about. Um, And uh, I'm very excited to see that Stevenson is starting to be taught in some political science classes. That's really cool. Uh, Very exciting. Yeah. Well, right, 
Right. And, and, the, and another, I mean, the problem of enforcement, even if there's only one meta rule that you can't leave, yeah, there's got to be somebody to enforce that. And the one, the one guy who says, you know, well, my borders have just become closed, you've got to go, according to this, you've got to go, you know, enlighten that person into uh, allowing free exit again. So there is, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, aliens, there we go. The aliens, it's, it's the freedom and the sex, because the sex is just kind of the side benefit of <laughs> the aliens. But th they can come down and... <laughs> oh, oh, but <laughs> that, is, that, that, that makes me very, very sad. But um, I don't think they're passing that out these days. They don't want you to know what it says. <laughs> Right. I mean, that does, yeah. And, and there, the notion even of, of educating the idea of what, what kind of instruction for children is inculcating them with ideas that will keep them close-minded to other options and what is you know, good moral teaching that you have your absolute right to, to give. Other, the, the example of the, you know, in, in the year 2525 and you have this pocket of Amish people do, do, do the Amish people, and this is the, an example because it's easy to pick on Amish people because I don't think there's any Amish people here. Um, you, know, well, well <laughs> you know, knowledge of the outside world, by the time they're 18 and they're supposed to go leave for a little while, do they, are they already holding so many ideas deeply instilled that they're not actually free to make a choice? That gets to be a really weird, weird position. But even, even the, what you're saying... If it takes a world state to enforce the rules that keep a world state from not existing, you've defeated yourself already. So it's kind of screwy. Yeah. Cuba. Right. 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 Because you, to use it to flee to a place that didn't consider spitting on the sidewalk a crime would be, you know, fleeing. Well, there's tied up in his. Uh, in his perspective, and I'm not actually sure he articulates it in this way, is um, a kind of <sighs> classical sense of the social contract that by being here, you're implicitly agreeing to the rules, um, which is why actually some really um, 
some libertarians um, don't vote and don't participate in, in government action because the possibility of doing that implies that you go along with the system and makes you, um, in one way or another, oh, thank you, <laughs> hey, <laughs> um, uh, makes you part of it. And if you, if you have that kind of implicit agreement with the state, then um, you're, you know, you're forfeiting the right to, to disagree or to go away from it. Um, if, you know, if you're walking on the public sidewalk and you spit, you're using the public sidewalk, wasn't that an implicit agreement to the, to the contract that you're a citizen in their state? Um, it does. It does. Which, the question, um, I mean, I don't want to go ridic get ridiculous about it, but the question of free exit, there were states that attempted to exit the United States and they were denied that, that, that choice. Now, I mean, in the sense that the U.S. Constitution was a compact of states and not of individuals, then should the states have had the right to free, free exit? I mean, the talk about secession has come up again, you know, with the red state, blue state thing. Um, yeah, I mean, not, <laughs> not in any way that's going to get on CNN, but as, you know, the, it's, it's uh, uh, half jest, but, you know, the question of whether you can leave or not. I feel like I'm wandering badly off topic. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yes, before the next. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you for the, for the opportunity. Yes, we're doing a thing. Um, it's being hosted at Belmont University, which is where I teach. Um, or at least I did before I gave this talk. Um, uh, <laughs> um, well, that will be part of the tape that, in, that mysteriously goes blank. Um, speaking of memory holes. Um, we're doing a special, okay, the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe film, the first of the Chronicles of Narnia films, comes out uh, on December 9th. Um, a month before that, we're having a, a special um, conference on C.S. Lewis at Belmont. It's going to be November 3rd through 5th. Uh, we're going to have the producer of the film, who also happens to be the stepson of C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. He's going to be speaking with us. Um, we're going to have like 45 uh, of the world's best scholars. We've got people participating from a number of different countries on C.S. Lewis. Uh, we're going to have a, a British actor named David Payne who tours the world doing an evening with C.S. Lewis, completely in character as C.S. Lewis. We're going to have um, an internationally recognized band, Glass Hammer, play a concert from their new album, The Inconsolable Secret, which is based on the work of C.S. Lewis, at one point backed up by 120 of our choir members singing in Elvish from J.R.R. Tolkien's work, and we're finishing up the whole thing with the uh, Nashville Symphony playing the Lord of the Rings Symphony um, from the Lord of the Rings films at Belmont. Um, the... Uh, the full registration is now closed. However, through this weekend, it will disappear on Monday, um, at our website, which is belmont.edu slash C.S. Lewis, um, tickets for the uh, An Evening with C.S. Lewis are still available, and tickets for the Glass Hammer concert are still available. Then those will also be available at the door at Belmont on the uh, 4th and 5th, respectively. Um, but if you go to our website, there's the whole conference um, layout uh, schedule, and we will have an area that's open the entire time to the public. It's called the Narnia on Tour Stop. There's an international Nar Narnia on Tour um, kind of educational thing going around, and we have a stop where we will have authors who write about um, C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien, Harry Potter, um, a lot of related subjects. Uh, there with their books, signing books. We'll have um, some great artists, including Melissa Gay, who just walked in uh, and walked out, um, showing their fantasy and science fiction-related art. 
um, we'll have different groups that write about the media and about films and film studies uh, and popular culture criticism there. Um, we'll have cool books to give away because a lot of presses have sent a lot of really cool stuff to us to give away. Um, so we'll have like hundreds of people there and we'll be doing crazy Narnia-inspired, fantasy-inspired stuff and um, looking at questions of how you know, really imaginative art um, moves from one medium to another, from, say, literature to film. And uh, we'll have um, behind-the-scenes uh, clips and special clips that the studios shared with us. So uh, we'd love to see you all there. And if you've got any questions, um, if you come to my website, you can just drop me an email, and I will uh, answer them to the best of my ability. But l the more the merrier. We'd love to see you. And thank you for the chance of making a plug there. And uh, thank you so much for, for uh, visiting with me tonight. I really appreciate it. <laughs>